Part one. You'll hear a conversation between Jill and Sue. First, you have some time to read questions one to six. Hello, Sue. Fancy meeting you here. It is Sue Johnson, isn't it? Oh, hi, Jill. It must be ages since we've seen each other. What a surprise! How are you? Yes, well,、uh, I'm fine. I just got back from two years teaching in Hong Kong, actually. Oh, I thought you'd gone into computing or nursing. No, I ended up being a teacher after all. And how about you? Oh, fine. Things are going quite well, in fact. So, what have you been up to over the last three years? Working, studying, you know, the usual things. Oh, and I got married last year. Congratulations! Anyone I know? Yeah, you might remember him from our college days.、Uh, do you remember Jerry? Jerry Fox. Jerry? Was he the one with the dark hair and beard? No, that was Sam. No, Jerry's got blonde hair and glasses. He's pretty tall. Well, we got married finally. Great. And where did the wedding take place? Was it here in London? No. In the end, we decided to get married in Scotland. Jerry's parents live there, so we were married in the small village church with the mountains in the background. Fabulous. Have you got any pictures? Well, funny you should ask. I have actually got a couple here. They're a bit battered because I've been carrying them around in my bag. <laughs> oh, never mind. Let's have a look. Oh, don't you look wonderful? Who are those people behind you?、Oh, that's my older sister, Clara. Oh, she looks like you. Do you think so? Everyone says that, but we can't see it. Is she married now? Yes, and she's got three children, a girl and twin boys as well. Wow! Imagine having twins. Look, why don't we have dinner together and catch up on a few things? Would you like to come over one evening? Oh, that'd be lovely. What about next Friday evening? Fine. What time? Shall I come over about eight o'clock? Oh, come about half past seven. I'm usually home around six thirty, so. That'd give me plenty of time to get dinner ready.、Oh, fine. And、um, one last thing: where do you live? What's the address? <laughs> oh, good thinking. Here's my card. The address is on the back. We've got a flat in an old house. We live on the third floor of a large old house. The house has been converted into flats. So when you arrive, you'll need to press the bell second from the top.、Uh, the bell second from the top. Okay. There's a little intercom arrangement, so I can let you in. Right. Okay. See you on Friday then. Before the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions seven to ten. Welcome, Jill. This is my husband, Jerry. Jerry, this is Jill. Hi, Jill. Nice to meet you.、Uh, hi, Jerry. Well, let's come in and take a seat. Sue told me that you've just returned from Hong Kong.、Uh, was it a pleasant trip? What kind of city is it? Oh well, Hong Kong enjoys a reputation for the flourishing business. It has a population of around six point six million. Much larger than that of Sydney, right? Sydney has a population of four million, I think. Yes.、Uh, did you enjoy staying there? Well, being a metropolis has advantages. You get the latest films and music. 
there's always something going on, and there's such a wide variety of different people and cultures that it's difficult to get bored. Of course, all this has its downside. The cost of living is very expensive, and most people cannot afford to go out very often. So, although the entertainment is available, you have to have a lot of money to enjoy it. Another problem is, like most big cities, there's a lot of crime. What about the weather? I suppose that it gets a lot of rain.、Mm, not always. In summer, it's humid, but it's cool and dry in winter. The average temperature in June and July is about ninety-one degrees Fahrenheit. Hotter than here. The best seasons are spring and autumn. They are mild and agreeable. Is there anything you particularly miss of staying there? Yes, the tasty local food is to my liking, especially the seafood. Hong Kong also enjoys the fame of a paradise for shopping, but I'm not very keen on that. You know, I suppose it must be your favourite. Most shopping malls in Hong Kong have longer opening hours than those in Sydney. Some are even open the whole night during the Christmas holidays. Oh, it sounds lovely! I hope I have a chance to travel there, and I can be your tour guide. Yes, that's great. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a member of the local council describing plans to redevelop part of the seafront of a coastal town. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Good evening, everybody. I wasn't expecting to see so many people. Clearly, this is an issue of great local interest. Thank you all for coming. Well, as you all know, I've come to talk about the council's plans for redeveloping the western part of the seafront. Firstly, of course, the Queen's Parade shopping centre is to be demolished. It was built on the cheap and in a hurry in 1953, and recently came third in a national newspaper's ugliest buildings in the country list. So I don't think anybody's going to miss it. The question was, what do we replace it with? Well, after consultations with the local community, we decided, as I'm sure most of you are aware. To replace it with a complex of small shops and workshops, plus a three-screen cinema, we particularly didn't want another bland glass and steel shopping centre full of the same old chain stores as every other town centre. No, this is our chance to do something just a little bit different. I'll start at the top. On the third floor will be a cafe. And a restaurant. Part of this will be open air, so people can enjoy a meal or a cup of coffee in the fresh air, weather permitting, of course. Below this will be the cinema, and below that, on the first floor, will be some much-needed council offices. We're getting very cramped in the town hall, I can assure you. On the ground floor will be twenty small shop units, ranging in size from twenty to fifty square meters. Also on the ground floor will be five workshop spaces, which we hope will attract small manufacturing businesses back to the town centre, providing some additional local employment. Underneath the centre will be an underground car park. 
not a great big car park like in the present centre. Our aim is that most visitors to the centre will come on foot or by bus. In fact, the car park will be restricted to people working in the centre and disabled visitors. Then, and perhaps this is the most exciting part of the project, the beach in front of the new complex is going to be completely transformed. We're going to extend the beach. Yes, extend it. 10,000 tonnes of sand is going to be brought in to make it into a proper beach instead of the dirty little strip of sand it is now. As well as being for the enjoyment of local people, we're hoping that a decent beach will attract more visitors to the town and that has to be good for local businesses. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now, I must emphasise that these plans have not yet been finalised. That's what this meeting is about. Of course, it's vital with a project like this that we have the support of local people. After all, we work for you and it's your money that's paying for it. So, first of all, the plans for the new centre are going to go on display in the town hall. They'll be there from Monday the 5th of March until Friday the 6th of April. Uh, plenty of time for anybody who's interested to get over there and have a look at them, I think. There'll be a suggestions box in the same room as the plans. Anybody who has anything to say is welcome to fill in a suggestions form. These forms will be looked at and taken seriously. You can be sure of that. Then on Tuesday, April the 10th, there'll be another public meeting much like this one and in this same place. It'll start at seven o'clock and there'll be a chance for local residents to address the council. We'll also report back to you on the results gathered in the suggestions box. Anyway, I'd now like to hand you over to my colleague, my fellow councillor. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a radio programme about buying a house. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon, listeners. Today, I'd like to welcome Edward Fox, who is going to talk to us today about buying a house. Edward. Thank you, Eunice. For most people, at least, buying a house is a major life event and probably the single most expensive item you are ever likely to buy. It is also a place that you can make your home. Therefore, thinking carefully before you make a purchase is of the utmost importance. One of the most important things to consider before buying any property is the location. Because remember, it is where you plan to spend a large part of your life, or indeed the rest of your life in some circumstances. Therefore, 
Consider the type of life you enjoy leading. Are you a very sociable person who enjoys nightclubs and discos? If so, then you may wish to consider something close to the city, or indeed in a city where it is convenient for all types of nightlife. On the other hand, if, like me, you prefer a quieter life, then you may want to consider something away from the city. However, do remember that proximity to your place of work is also important. Indeed, we spend most of our life at work, and you don't want to have to spend two or more hours every day travelling to work now, do you? Therefore, transport is the utmost importance. City suburbs, however, are often conveniently located for commuting to work, all for shopping, without being in the heart of a busy city. You may, however, think that a house in the suburbs would be far too expensive. Yet houses located in cities can often exceed the price of suburban houses. So check out the prices. You may be surprised. Family is another important consideration. You may prefer a house that is away from a busy street or main road. And of course, remember that children have to attend school. Is there a good school in the area, or would your children have to travel a long distance to get to school? Therefore, if you have children or you plan to have children, location is a very important factor. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. There are, of course, various types of houses. There are detached houses which stand alone and are not joined by to another building. Then there are semi-detached houses, which incidentally are the most common, and for good reason, because they are less expensive than detached houses. This is because they are, in fact, two houses joined together and therefore take up less space. And finally, there are townhouses, which are many houses joined together to form a long row. But don't think that townhouses are less expensive than semi-detached houses. They rarely are. This is because they are usually built in cities where the prices of property is very expensive indeed. The age of property is another consideration. If you're considering buying an old house, beware. You may be faced with expensive repairs and renovation bills. So have the house. Thoroughly checked by a professional surveyor before you decide to buy. But then again, there are things you can look for yourself. Things such as the condition of the woodwork, especially doors and windows, that can be expensive to replace. More importantly, make sure all the fixtures and fittings, things such as cupboards, sinks, taps, bathtubs, are all in good working order. Because replacing kitchens and bathrooms can be a very costly business. And don't forget the garden. If the property has one, if you enjoy gardening, then fine. But if you don't enjoy gardening, then you may prefer a small garden as opposed to a big one. But even if you do enjoy gardening, it is important to remember that gardens take up a lot of your time. So keeping a garden in good order may be very difficult if you work long hours. One final thing is the general feel of the place. Does it have a good atmosphere? And most importantly of all, would you feel comfortable living there? Thank you, Edward. But I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. But I'll be back next Wednesday when my guest speaker will be talking about buying a computer. So until then, bye for now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. 
you'll hear a lecturer talking to students about sport in Ireland. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, today we're going to be finding out about the most popular sports in the Emerald Isle. That's Ireland, of course. Can you guess what they are? Well, there are these two lesser played games, a form of rounders and Gaelic handball. But we'll start with one which is perhaps over 3,000 years old, arriving in Ireland with the Celts, some claim. That may be a slight exaggeration but I consider it to be the fastest field game in the world, and it goes by the name of hurling. Well, that's what it's known as in the English-speaking world anyway. So, what do you have to do? You've got 15 players on a team, one of them the goalkeeper. Each one has a stick called a hurley. Here you are. I've brought mine along. Had it since I was at school. This is what it looks like, and basically, you have to get this ball, called a schlitter, that's S-L-I-O-T-A-R, so it's not spelt the way it's pronounced. You hit it into the net for three points, or you can hit it over the net for one point. The goal looks like the letter H, with the net under the crossbar. The goalie has a bigger stick than the others to help keep the ball out. You can also catch the schlither and run with it for four steps maximum or bounce it on your stick. Is that clear to you all? I'll be showing you a video a bit later so you can see what a game actually looks like. You might like to think of it as a mixture of lacrosse, hockey and baseball. Oh, and it's played by women too, but it goes by the name of camogie in that case. I'll give you a bit of the history, shall I now? Generally, the golden age of the game is considered to be the 18th century. But systematic rules were first agreed and drawn up at that great shrine of learning, Trinity College Dublin, in 1879, founding the Irish Hurling Union, closely followed just a few years later by the formation of the Gaelic Athletics Association. With greater organisation last century, the All-Ireland Hurling Championship got off to a flying start, and I'm proud to say that my own native city of Cork has won more than 20 titles over the years. But then, so have Kilkenny and Tipperary. Is it only played in Ireland? No. Well, it is the only country with a national team at the moment, but you may be surprised to discover there are hurling clubs in London, as well as in America and Argentina, to name just a few. The other game I'd like to take a little time to introduce you to is Gaelic football, which is played on the same pitch as hurling with the same number of players. But there's no net. You just have to get the ball over your opponent's goalposts. And you can do that by kicking or punching the ball. However, you're not supposed to do that to the players, I might add. Imagine it as a combination of soccer and basketball. But in my opinion, it's a more exciting spectacle than either of those. Excuse my bias, if you will. It's also very popular with women. In fact, there are more women's teams than for any other sport. Whether despite or because of the physical contact involved, I wouldn't like to say. They do play a shorter game, 60 minutes, rather than the men's 70. So, let's have a look. If we can have the lights down, I'll see if I can get this technology to work. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.